update that we're about to consume. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Roy Schneider and Ted Schneider, who will be presenting today. So let's give them a round of applause. Well, good morning, employer and employee-related type people. We are so glad to see you here, and, and I hope you will enjoy this good morning. Uh, thanks to Chamber and SCORE for partnering with us on this. We always appreciate that. And we definitely appreciate the Sierra Bank for uh, sponsoring this event. The, the event is scheduled from 8 to 10. There's a typo, it really is 10 p.m. So, <laughs> so settle down and settle in. There's an awful lot to cover. So if you have questions, please hold them until the end if we have time. Otherwise, Ted and I will hang around for we'll some answer your questions. You can email us, uh, whatever. You know, you want. Also, the, the uh, handouts that we gave, they really not meant for anybody over 40. Uh, <laughs> the print is so tiny, you probably can't read it. So if you have trouble um, reading the print on it, you can take notes and you'll see it. But contact us, either info or Angela or Petermi, and we will send you the uh, email. So we get big letters. So you can read it and print it in big letters. Uh, it's just how it comes out. Okay, so we're going to um, kind of begin. Uh, oh, yeah. The Governor Brown left office and he signed up with a thousand laws. And of course, you presume to know the laws. So by calling any of you, would you be able to tell us all a thousand laws? And a thousand laws from the year before that, a thousand laws before that? Of course not. You presume to know them. So it's never an excuse to say, hey, I didn't know that's the law. But if you ever have questions, not just an employment, but contracts, or you know, dealing with customers, or privacy rights, or you know, anything, you know, contact lawyers, pay a little bit of money, uh, and, and so forth. We're full service firm, we do contracts, sell your business, buy your business, uh, employment, you know, non-profits, estate planning, succession planning. So think of us for your legal needs. But here, but we do a lot of employment, that's one of our big deals. And even though employment law is so complicated, a lot of the answers are in your handbook. So I can't stress enough get a current updated handbook. Lately, we've been having to update it almost every year. But when you have an HR issue, first thing you do is look at that handbook, and there's often the answers right there about uh, leaves and so on. So you also get a good handbook. And if you need questions on that, let us know. If you have a questionnaire, we send you. Get your handbook back to you first. Uh, okay, so welcome to California. Things are what happened. I wait, okay, we talk about this a lot, and people seem to miss it. I think uh, Walmart has not attended our last seminar. That there's wage orders. If you know wage orders, there's 17 different wage orders covering different industries. And so you should know which wage order. These are put up by the you know, Department of Labor and uh, the Education's Office. Um, uh, which wage order? Uh, covers your business. And you should read and understand it. There's also a minimum wage order. And if you don't know, we can certainly help you which wage order. You should read it because there's some subtle things in there, such as the suitable seating law. We talk about this every time. That's subtle. It's in there like that. Subtle, suitable seating law says if the job that your employee is doing can accommodate a seat, you must provide a seat. And if the job doesn't accommodate a seat, you must have the seats close enough in proximity that that employee can sit down if he or she wants to. Now, do you know how far a proximity is? <laughs> no, well, it's like a, a still You know, but there's a way to kind of figure this out. Walmart didn't figure it out and they just got tagged recently for $65 million. Okay, so they, and they couldn't figure this law. So you gotta read these things, very important, uh, do that. The change has been, uh, yeah, so look at your other city poster. Got a poster? The chamber has posters for you. So you can only contact the chamber to get posters. If you ever get a random audit, there's no posters, there's fines and penalties. Okay, so the, uh, as you know, the effect of this year is take minimum wage increase to $11 an hour for those with 25 or fewer employees, and $12 an hour for employers with 26 or more. Various cities have their own. Dozens of cities have their own minimum wage requirements. All right? um, and, and, and it affects all kinds of things. Now, what people ask this question, but as you know, probably, to be an exempt employee, you have to receive twice minimum wage. Twice minimum wage. So somebody asked, is it twice minimum wage in the city where they're at, with their minimum wage, or is it twice the state minimum wage? Good question. 
is twice the state minimum wage. So if you're in LA making 1325 an hour, you have to pay them twice the $11 an hour. Okay, that makes sense. And these changes affect the you know, uh, meal breaks, rest breaks, credits, overtime. You have on, on site managers, there's changes in how much I mean, on site you know, resident managers, how much credits they get. Uh, piece rate employment changes with these increases. The piece rate employees are supposed to pay them the least minimum wage for non productive time. Um, Tools and equipment, there's some rules about it. Uh, if you pay somebody twice the minimum wage, they might have to provide their own hand tools. So it affects a lot of your practice, a lot of the business that you do. Uh, this is the uh, chart, and you can see what the exempt rate is. Okay, so you have uh, under 25, under 26, this is what you have to pay over for the following few years, you can see. And this is the way that you have 26 or more. So this is a good chart to have. Um, it's just a very recent case, LA restaurant. A guy, owner, he had you know, a dozen or so servers, and he told them to kind of work off the clock, didn't get no overtime, didn't do that lunch breaks, uh, and, and labor commissioner determined that people average about $4 an hour, and he got hit with a $500,000 fine from the labor commission. So he tried to save a few bucks, ain't gonna work. Uh, also, we have um, other areas like computer software people and physicians. Computer software people, you have programmers, not IT people, but a computer programmer, and you want to avoid overtime for them. There's also increases in which you have to pay them. Something like $45 an hour, $78 a month, $95,000 a year. So if you have those kind of people, let us know, we'll give you the exact amount. But a lot of changes every year with these changes. Uh, and here's an example of LA. And again, there's dozens of cities that have their own. And gee, when do you have to pay the LA rate, or the San Bernardino rate, or the Riverside rate? If you have an employee that works more than two hours in a week in one of these cities, then you must pay that minimum wage, at least, for every hour they work in that city. So you need to know. If you have questions about what city's wage is what, let us know, we can tell you what that hourly wage is. Okay, so Ted now is going to talk about uh, some of the new legislation, and then we'll move along. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ted Schneider. Thank you for being here. Let's uh, go through some of the new statutes. Uh, okay, paid family leave. I get a lot of questions about paid family leave. People seem to be confused about what paid family leave really is. It is not a leave of absence. Paid family leave does not give your employees the right to take a leave of absence. Paid family leave is a state wage replacement benefit through the state of California. If you are going to take leave to bond with a new child, let's say under CFRA baby bonding, for example, uh, or if you are taking FMLA leave because uh, you're caring for a seriously ill family member, then you could apply for paid family leave wage replacement. Um, this new law creates uh, an additional reason to where, where an employee could receive paid family leave if that employee is taking FMLA to care for a spouse who's in the military, who has qualifying exigency leave under FMLA for the military. Uh, it's kind of a very narrow uh, exception that won't come up very often, but I think it's important, I wanted to highlight uh, just this change in paid family leave because I get questions all the time, well, but it says in our handbook that paid family leave gives you six weeks of leave but no, it doesn't. It gives you the right to apply for wage replacement benefits if your employer, if you, already grant that employee leave through some other leave right that it already existed. It doesn't create a new, a new right to leave. Lactation accommodation. So in California, up until this point, we had a, a law that says that if you are a uh, breastfeeding mother, that you have the right to uh, express breast milk in a location, in a private location, other than a bathroom, uh, or excuse me, other than a toilet stall. That's what the law said before. 
Now it says, other than a bathroom. So if you have pregnant employees or uh, women who have just given birth, you need to provide those women a private location, it could be an office, uh, where they can express breast milk, but it can't be a bathroom. Uh, it has to be something else. Uh, and, and there is an undue hardship exception, but undue hardship is a very high standard to meet. Uh, it'd be hard to think of an office or a location, employment location, where you would not have a private place for the woman to express breast milk. If the law even says, for example, you could have, a, if you're out in the field, let's say it's a construction project, a, an air-conditioned vehicle would be acceptable in those situations. Okay, salary history. This is a big one. This one, this is a new law that came up last year. You as employers are prohibited from asking any prospective applicant, any applicant, uh, about their salary history. You cannot consider an employee's salary history in determining what that employee's salary will be for you. The uh, California Fair Pay Act was designed to avoid this systemic uh, wage disparity between men and women. Uh, and when new employers look at a, a woman's previous salary history, well now you're just building in all that past discrimination where the women's wages were suppressed. So you can't consider past salary. Your, your, your employment applications make sure that they do not have uh, a box for previous salary. It's not allowed. Um, the new law says that uh, you can ask an applicant about their salary expectations. So you are allowed to ask what are your expectations for salary. You also have to provide a candidate with a salary range. If they ask for a salary range, or excuse me, a pay scale, you have to have one for that position. So if you are opening up a position for recruiting, make sure you have a pay scale decided that you can provide to an applicant who asks for it. You only have to provide that pay scale, scale after completing an initial interview. Um, you don't have to provide it to uh, existing employees, the pay scale for the position, only to external applicants. Um, pay attention. Prior salary cannot be used to justify wage differential even between current employees. Even if you, your existing employees, prior salary cannot be used to justify any wage differential. So you've got to examine all of your employees' salary, and if you've got women and men or employees of different races who are doing the same job or essentially the same job and they're making a different salary, you better examine that and you better see why that is and correct it. Um, now you are allowed to consider salary history if the applicant in an interview volunteers the information. So if, if all of a sudden you're interviewing a, a candidate and she blurts out that she used to make $80,000 a year. You, know, you don't have to cover your ears and go, stop. You can now consider that information because it was voluntarily given to you, but you can't ask for it. You can't try to elicit it in any other way. So it's, it's very important when you're, when you're making your compensation decisions that they are justified by factors, uh, merit, seniority, not prior salary. Criminal background checks. Um, so this is another area where a lot of employers were getting confused. We have a ban the box ordinance now in California that took effect last year. We talked about that in our last update. Now there's some clarifications with SB 1412. If you are an employer that is required by law to uh, check the, the criminal backgrounds of your employees, then you can do that. Uh, if you have a position where the employee is going to possess or use a firearm, you are allowed to consider criminal uh, conviction history, even if those convictions have been judicially sealed or expunged. Uh, or if, for example, there's a specific law 
local, state, or federal law that says that if you are convicted of a specific crime, you cannot hold this position, then as the employer, you are allowed to do a criminal background check for that specific crime. Now, you know, this obviously, this applies to companies that are government contractors. I get a lot of questions from government contractor clients who do work for the federal government. Well, the federal government requires me to run criminal background checks. Well, now this law makes it clear that you can do that. Schools, you know, daycare operations, obviously would be permitted. Uh, you gotta be careful though, that if you are going to review a conviction that was uh, judicially sealed or expunged, and you're gonna rely on that conviction to deny the job, it has to be a conviction that relates directly to the job. It has to be a specific conviction <laughs> that would pro prohibit the employee from taking that job. So it's pretty, it's pretty narrow. Uh, okay, Roy's gonna come up now and talk about some discrimination uh, and harassment laws that have come in. Okay, um, we'll move along on this. How are you doing? Let me know when your head's about this thing. We'll be fully cautious. Uh, a little over a year ago, um, when the Harvey Weinstein story broke, Alyssa Milano, and I'm using the state on television now, she came out with a tweet, Twitter tweet that said that if you've been sexually assaulted or harassed, yeah, just tweet Me Too. Well, the Me Too hashtag has uh, millions of hits uh, over the next few days from every country, every continent, 85 countries, every continent. Facebook has, you know, 17 of uh, them, 12 million posts within days after she posted that. It started the Me Too movement uh, in sexual harassment. So it, it's taken over. California's been particularly aggressive about trying to protect the people from harassment. Uh, and there's been a number of new laws that were promulgated because of the Me Too movement. And we'll talk about some of those now. <laughs> One of these is sexual harassment defamation protection. Okay, there, there's general laws about <coughs> defamation, and you have certain privileges. You can talk to people who are interested in the subject matter, as long as you don't have malice uh, about stuff, and you may be protected as a defense for defamation. People in the workplace may want to talk about like saying was fired, and if there's no malice there, that's generally protected. But there didn't seem much protection from uh, harassers, or alleged harassers, who sue for defamation because their reputations are ruined because they've been accused of sexual assault or harassment. So now there's a specific statute that says that victims who come forward and talk, employers who talk to the victims, the witnesses, witnesses who talk, uh, or have a defense to a claim for defamation. If the harasser, uh, alleged harasser, claims his reputation was ruined, now the will also cease because it says it has to be without malice. Malice means ill will, hatred, no malice for falsity, or no regard for the truth of that. That's malice. And so an alleged harasser who thinks, uh, I can do it. If there's nothing malice, they'll sue anyone. Right? They're just going to allege there was malice. But anyway, this is a statutory protection. Another one that's interesting, we've had a protection for a while. If you are an employer and you get a reference call, and somebody would say, you know, you're not going to tell them, oh, the guy's late, he's lazy, you can't, you know, you've got to be careful if you sue. But if they ask you, would you rehire this person, you could say no. And that was protection from defamation. Now, if, they, if the person who calls you says, will you not hire them because of sexual harassment claims, you can, if you choose, you can say yes. Okay, that's not protected. If you choose, you don't have to. So that is a statutory protection. Confidentiality, um, yeah, until now, and there's uh, employers who receive sexual harassment claims, uh, they enter into settlement agreements that provide for giving you money, and you're not to disclose any facts, not to disclose anything about this dispute, right? That's why you said it, you'll say nothing. New law basically says that um, prohibits settlement provisions that prevent the disclosure of factual information relating to the claims of sexual assault, sexual harassment, sex discrimination, failing to prevent sexual harassment, discrimination, uh, retaliation, uh, in, in any action that is filed in a civil or administrative action. So, if, there, if this is a settlement, based on somebody filing a claim, administrative or lawsuit, 
You may not have in your settlement agreement a statement that says you must, you cannot disclose the facts. Okay. Now, what the question of course is that means. What are the facts? That's the whole dispute. You know, we've settled the case. You know, the facts are you say you were harassed, I say you weren't. What are the, what are the facts? So the facts are clearly, gee, uh, I filed a claim for sexual harassment and we resolved it. That's a fact. You can't prevent them from saying that. But maybe now we're not sure what that means, facts. Do we have to go back and look at the pleadings and, and depositions to see what the facts are? So maybe we put in the settlement agreements, you know, that we agree that this is the facts. File the claim, it's resolved. Everything else is disputed. So that, that's something new. Um, so it's not just to be quiet. It's not just to keep things quiet. And really, it's to prevent the serial harassment, the serial harassment. Somebody who keeps harassing, and they pay somebody a few bucks, and they keep quiet, and they go on to the next one. But is it going to be more difficult to settle now? Because the employer knows you can go around telling people. Now you can prevent, if they want, the person's name. So I'm the employer, I can't talk about Sally. You can say the name must be confidential, and the dollar amount. But the facts of the thing you can no longer just close up. And that is a, a civil code of procedure provision. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Help you know. Uh, also, a lot of new expansion for family employment and housing. That's in the government code. A lot of new protections for employees under that. It used to be when there was a suit by employee E for one of the violations of family employment housing, sexual harassment, for example, the employer would try very hard to get summary judgment. That's the goal. They got something called summary judgment. So you never get to a jury, right? Uh, and it was difficult for employees to win on a summary judgment claim because they have to prove certain things. If they can't, then the court, they, the judge won't let you go to court. They say you lose. So they have to prove certain things. So the legislation is actually a declaration by the legislature in the law that says it, it, summary judgment should almost never be used for sexual harassment cases. It is not appropriate for sexual harassment cases. That should make that statement, not law, but the statement of how they feel about that. Uh, and they also reject long-following uh, federal court decisions regarding what you must prove. And the federal, on the law that we've been following for a long time too, was the, the, a victim has to allege that their productivity suffered because of this. That this was so severe and pervasive in their lives that they didn't start to work as much, they were not as productive, they made more mistakes, you had to prove that. The, this legislation rejects that, actually makes a statement, we reject that. And we actually adopt Justice Ginsburg a concurring opinion in some Supreme Court case that you, know, you don't need to show that. Just make sure you're intimidated, that makes going to work more difficult, but you don't just show the productivity as also at the time. Also, um, part of severe and pervasive, part of severe and pervasive, they used to say, the Supreme Court of the United States actually, but I don't want to call that, um, a single incident, for example, was not enough. A single incident would not be enough to prove it, unless it was, you know, wait. But a single incident of a statement or a touch may not be enough. Now that a single incident is enough. And they've done away now with the stray remarks doctrine. It was another federal law, federal court case that we've done away with. Stray remarks was, you know, one off. Somebody makes a statement, makes a dirty joke, makes a comment about your looks. You know, it's called stray remark. It has nothing to do with anything. That was not a claim for sexual harassment. Now it can be. Even if it's not made by the decision maker, even if it's not said in an employment contract, even if it's just kind of like a joke, one off, never done before or after, a stray mark may be enough. Okay, the super sexual harassment. That's kind of interesting. Um, it also makes it unlawful for an employer, this is interesting, you know, sometimes um, you might have a bad manager. What happens? You just find out that this guy goes around and he's doing all kinds of stuff. Not just any sexual harassment, but racial, religious, color, making jokes, making stuff. So sometimes what you do is, okay, we're gonna just start fresh. We're gonna give everybody, you know, two thousand dollars, and they're gonna waive all their claims. Just gonna do it. Whether they were harassed or discriminated, just gonna do that. You can't do that anymore. Okay? You cannot just be in exchange for your continued employment, uh, to be hired in the first place, to get a raise, to get a bonus, to get any money, waive your rights or claims. Okay? can't do that. Unless it's part of a uh, negotiated settlement or severance following either a you know, claim of the court, claim of the administrative agency, 
or a claim that wouldn't trigger the internet dispute process, then you can agree that they're not going to, uh, they're waiving their claims, obviously. You're going to pay their money, have to negotiate it, have to be fair, pay the money, uh, they have to have a right to have a lawyer, get a lawyer. So there's processes now. You just can't pay people money to shut them up and waive their claims. A lot of people do that. They call me and say, oh, I, I know that people are, uh, are thinking they might sue me, I want them to waive their claims. Can't do that. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, also, part of this new law is it was clear that if a non employee sexually harassed one of your employees and you knew about it, you have to do something about it. Now it extends to any kind of discrimination or harassment race, color, creed, male origin, whatever. If you know non employees are saying things or doing things to your employees and you learn about it, you must take action. Okay? So be very careful about how employees. You know, your customers treat your employees. So that's kind of interesting. And the last thing is, on this, and there's a whole lot of this going on, um, the, the basic law is, if there's a lawsuit, and I'm the defendant, and I want to settle, I can send you a statement called a 998. This is, I'll pay you X dollars. And, and, and if the law is that the prevailing party gets attorney's fees, and you don't do better than what I say in my statement, I get my attorney's fees as a defendant. That's what they do. So they thought they could do that in the employment context. When the employee sues, the employer sends a 998, and I'll pay you this much money. The employee wins and doesn't get that much money. Uh, the court said the employer does not get his attorney's fees. The law, the statute, you don't get your attorney's fees unless you can prove the plaintiff's claim was frivolous. You, you never can prove it's frivolous. Okay? It would never get to the trial, the court, they can prove it's frivolous. So there's a bunch of stuff. So if you have claims, if you think you have claims, you are concerned, let us know, and we can help you guys through this. It's just a lot to know. Another big one is now the sexual harassment prevention training. As you know, until January 1, if you had 50 or more employees, you had to have sexual harassment prevention training every two years. Now it's starting this year, it's five. So if you have five employees, including seasonal uh, people, you must have sexual harassment prevention training used to be two hours for supervisors. Now it is two hours for supervisors, one hour for non-supervisors. Everybody gets trained. And you do it every two years. So if you did it in 2018, you still got to do it in 2019. Everybody must be trained by December 31 of this year. Supervisors, not supervisors. Uh, the Department of Federal Home and Housing is supposed to come up with the training program. That should be economical for employers. People go online and they, they see the Department of Family and Housing webinar, whatever programs they have, that will be sufficient. They haven't the, the, developed it yet. They're saying maybe we'll have it by the end of the year. <laughs> so meanwhile, <laughs> right? So meanwhile, uh, you need to think about it. And you can have it done with having people like them like come and talk to your people. Uh, there are webinars from qualified companies. There's e-learning programs. There are things you can do. The Department of Family and Housing, knowing they may be late. Uh, have they have they toolkit? This list all you can go to the website and get their toolkit for sexual prevention training, um, and, and it discusses uh, what you have to cover. But it has to be presented by a qualified trainer. Qualified trainers are lawyers. <coughs> they can be law school professors or college professors who do <coughs> employment law, or they can be trained HR people. So if you have questions about that, let us know. Uh, there's all kinds of things on that. If you hire somebody that's going to be a temporary. Season, less than six months. They got to be trained within the uh, first 30 days or the first 100 hours they work. If you use a temp agency, the agency trains them. You don't have to. And it's every two years um, after that. And you can either have slots for everybody's two years individually or you can have a training time. They got to be September 15th for training people. It's the way you do it. And you can also have the training in increments. So if you have a computer program training, they don't have to sit there for the whole two hours. Hour, they can do it in increments, as long as they fill up the whole time. Current regulations say that the lowest increment time you can have is 30 minutes. That may change. Okay, so we have to wait and see, but it is, it is big now. Also, you have to have abusive conduct, like that's about bullying. And then you gotta have programs on gender discrimination, identity, gender expression, uh, and, and training about that. And also now, uh, but men are required to have bystander training. So what does your employees do if they witness some kind of harassment going on? So this is new. You have until the end of the year to deal with it. But it's something to think about. Uh, 
no longer waiver right to testify. A lot of times in a settlement agreement, you would say, we're going to pay you money, this, this case is done, over and settled, and whatever we've done, you're not going to ever testify in a court proceeding about this. Can't do that anymore. Okay? And somebody is requested by a legislature, <coughs> or the courts, or administrative agency, or the subpoenas, you cannot stop them from testifying about what happened to them and about the settlement. Okay? You can stop them from volunteering. At the public. They can't go to the city council to stand up and say, you know, how bad you are. But that is an important thing. And the last thing I think I'm going to talk about is. Oh, no. uh, we went on the borders. Do you know about this? This is kind of interesting. Publicly traded companies. If any of you are looking for a publicly traded company that's headquartered in California, this year you must have a female on your board. You must. Uh, and, and by 2021, if you have four or fewer board members, at least one female. If you have five, you must have at least two females. If you have three, six or more, you must have three females. Now, interesting studies have shown, and the legislature talked about it, that companies with females on their boards do better. It's much more profitable. Uh, and what's interesting is, uh, who knows if this is legal? I can see all kinds of constitutional issues. You, know, you must put a woman on the board. You know, and then you must put a Hispanic on the board. I mean, where do we go? But it's a question. Then Governor Brown recognized it. He actually signed on the thing. I question the legality of this thing. But did that anyway. And it's kind of clever because is anybody going to challenge this? Is some company going to say, I don't want any helping women on my board? <laughs> no, I, I can't imagine it. And by the way, women control the market. Mostly public traded companies, basically you know, consumer type things. And kind of so uh, it'd be very interesting. And, and, and I teach, I'm a professor at Cal Lutheran, I teach business law. Uh, and I talk about this to my students. And interestingly, a number of the women said, I think this is unfair. Shouldn't they just have the most qualified person? Well, when you tort, because they're supposed to have critical thinking, that's what you need, is, um, yeah, but women have not had the same opportunities in the corporate America. They're not going to be as qualified. So the law recognizes that and says, you don't have to replace them. You can just add a board seat and put a woman in. So it's an interesting thing, we'll see what it does. But it, it, that's the law. Oh, and if you don't do it, it's $100,000 fine the first time, $300,000 every time after that. And the Secretary of State of California will make a list of publicly traded companies in California that don't comply with this. So we'll see what that goes. Fascinating, huh? Uh, if you are in the uh, talent business, you have uh, talent, you know, talent agents, agents, you know, you get, you get uh, people, you do commercials, whatever. Um, you must now, then this year, get adults, all kinds of materials on sexual harassment, <coughs> prevention, uh, retaliation, all the stuff about sexual harassment, plus eating disorders. So people are being, you know, they have eating disorders, so you got to give those materials. If it's somebody between 14 and 17, you actually got to have a training program for them and their families. Okay, so that's something new, uh, and we can only help you with that. If you're in that business, and this, this is the last thing I'm talking about. Professional relationships. <coughs> this is such a big part of our law here. The law was that if you had a professional relationship, such a doctor, lawyer, or family, and it was difficult for the victim to extricate himself or herself, they have a claim for sexual violence. You cannot date them, you cannot do things. There's some rules you can't do. Sexual violence, they have issues. Uh, this law now expands that to cover government, you know, public officials now, investors, you know, people who want, you want something from somebody, their rights to ask for sexual favors. You want me to invest in your company, directors, producers, so you get the list is longer, and you no longer have to show that it would be difficult to execute. Now, and the typical situation was in the divorce, the divorce lawyer, the, the, the wife in the middle of this, it's very hard just to switch lawyers, and they just succumb to some of the you know, suggestions of the lawyer. So you don't have to show that, that it's difficult. So that, that's kind of a new thing as well. Okay, so now Ted's going to talk about some more legislation. <laughs> Okay, so on the same uh, topic of harassment, the two new laws to strengthen whistleblower protections for legislative staffers. If you, uh, you see the issues we have in uh, the government, 
with uh, legislators, behavior, and now if you are a staffer for a legislator, you ha are very much protected from retaliation for reporting uh, harassment or ethical violations by anyone in the, uh, any legislat le legislator. So this is a trend I think we're gonna see right here. Number of new bills that came out very specific to the industry. Uh, one is construction industry, PAGA. Uh, if you are in the construction industry and you have a collective bargaining agreement, PAGA does not apply. So a, a contractor cannot be sued for, uh, with a PAGA claim if there's a collective bargaining agreement in place. Uh, there's a new legislative fix for petroleum facility rest breaks. If you remember last year, we said that the new law is that you cannot require your employees to remain on premises during their 10 minute rest breaks. They are free to come and go as they please and be completely relieved of all duty. <coughs> well, the petroleum industry was like, well, okay, but what happens when one of our oil lines starts leaking or something? So they said, okay, that's a good idea. We better put in an exception for safety sensitive positions at petroleum facilities, they can remain on call and carry constant communication devices during the rest of the So I think we're gonna see a lot more of these very industry specific laws as uh, the, uh, the cases come down. You know, meal period exceptions, if you're transporting commercial feed to customers in a remote area, uh, well, you don't have to take your 30 minute meal period. So, the practicalities of these laws are hitting certain industries harder than others, obviously, and the fix is legislation. So this is really important. If you are at all involved in the construction industry, uh, and it could be not just necessarily building houses, but anything related to the uh, re rehabilitation of, of any type of project, uh, remodel, a direct, the general contractor can be liable for the unpaid wages of the subcontractor. So this is really uh, difficult for general contractors because uh, now you have to actually put in your contract with your subcontractor, you have to put in there that you want to review the payroll records of your subcontractor that you have the right to review that the, the payroll of your sub to make sure that before you pay your sub, that the sub has paid its employees. Because if the sub is not properly paying its employees, the sub's employees can go after you, the general. Um, so really look at your contracts. Uh, fortunately, the legislator didn't want to be too hard on the general contractor, so in the new bill, you're only liable for unpaid wages, not for the fines and the penalties. A little gift. Um, so another topic that's in law a lot is human trafficking. And we saw last year certain industries now are required to post notices about human trafficking. Now, SB 970 and AB 2034, if you are in the hotel or motel business, any employee who will be interacting with potential victims of human trafficking, that would be people in your reception area, your housekeeping staff, your maintenance staff, people moving luggage in and out of the hotel, they all have to be trained 20 minutes of human trafficking awareness training that must be completed before January 1st, 2020, so by the end of this year, you have to train those uh, individuals on spotting human trafficking, potential victims of human trafficking. 20 minute training session. We have no idea what the content of that training is supposed to have at this point, but presumably we'll find out soon. And similarly, transportation related businesses, you know, buses, uh, taxi businesses, things like that. They have to have uh, training for all of their employees, 20 minutes on January 1st of 2021. 20 minute training on how to identify potential victims of human trafficking and then what to do, where to send them, phone numbers to call, things like that. 
All right. So last year, the California Supreme Court kind of dropped a duke to the bomb on us. If anybody uses independent contractors, or if anyone acts as an independent contractor, this affects you. Um, Dynamax. For many years, uh, California has used something called the Borello test to determine whether someone is an employee or an independent contractor. Now, you can't just pick, I want you to be a 1099 independent contractor or you're going to be a W-2 employee. The law dictates which is the relationship. Under this new Dynamax test, everybody is presumed to be an employee. Anybody who works for you is presumed to be your employee. It doesn't matter what kind of contract you have with them. They're doing work for you, they're presumed to be your employee, and your burden, it's your burden as the employer, to show that this individual is an independent contractor. Now, even more confusing is the Dynamex test, which I'm gonna go through here in just a second, only applies to wage order claims. So that means a worker can be an employee for purposes of wage order compliance, which is the meal breaks, the rest breaks, uh, the uh, minimum wage, things like that, unpaid wages. But for purposes of workers' comp, unemployment insurance, uh, wrongful termination, waiting time penalties, the Dynamex te test does not apply. The old Borello test applies. So you can have the same worker, for some purposes, he's your employee, and for other purposes, he's an independent contractor. You have to withhold uh, income tax, <laughs> but not uh, pay for workers' comp. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Um, and uh, so let's, let's look at what exactly the Dynamex test entails. It, it's a three-factor test, A, B, C. The court, in its infinite wisdom, thought that we were gonna be simplifying our lives. That's yeah, just three things. A, B, C, if you fit these three things, you're an independent contractor. All right, so what's A? A is that you have to be uh, free from the control of the hiring entity and the performance of the work. Now, this is a familiar factor. This factor is from the Morello test. Most independent contractors, if you hire an independent contractor to come do work for your business, you really just care about the result. You don't need to control the method, the tools that the person uses, how the person accomplishes the task. You care about how that task is completed. Uh, an independent contractor can refuse work assignments. An independent contractor can set his or her own hours. Control, independent contractors have control over their work. Employees, you control the tools, the methods, the hours, the working conditions. So this this factor is familiar. Okay, I think you know we can we can manage that. How about B? As you're thinking through in your mind the kind of of independent contractors you use, B is that if this worker is performing work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business then they could be considered an independent contractor. Hmm. Work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. So the Supreme Court gives us a real helpful example. A retail store hires an outside plumber to repair a leak in a bathroom, or an electrician to install a new electrical line for the retail store. Well, those services are clearly outside of the usual course of business of a retail store. They're not in the business of plumbing, or electrical. So they satisfy the B test. Well, okay, what about a large retail chain that has in-house plumbers and electricians because they have so many stores? When one of those stores now needs to call in an outside electrician, is that electrician now your employee for the day? Because the usual course of your business is, yeah, we do a lot of plumbing and electrical repairs as part of our retail chain, unanswered. So we'll talk about B here in a second with another example. Uh, and then the C test is 
The worker has to be in an independently established trade or business. Independently established. So what does that mean? They have to have shown the initiative to be out on their own in their own business. They've incorporated, they have a website, they have marketing materials, they have a business license, they have an EIN number. You're not doing a 1099 with a social security number, you're doing a 1099 with an EIN number. And it's, a, it's an ink, it's a corporation that you're doing business with. Um, but here's very important, in this first part, uh, the first bullet here, it requires a showing that the worker has independently made the decision to go into business for him or herself. One of the ways, one of the things we're seeing is people will say, well, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and pay to incorporate my worker so that this person, even though she works within the usual course of our business, I'm gonna, incorporate her, and that way I can treat her as an independent contractor. Well, that, that wasn't her decision. She didn't make that decision on her own to go into business. You're telling her, this is how we're gonna do it, so I can avoid paying you as an employee. Um, now, what happens if you hire uh, someone who just went into business and you're their first customer? Is that an independently established trade or business? If you're their only customer, are they really in business? What if they never get another customer? Probably not. It's probably your employee. And here's the example. The, this is a Garcia. It's the first case we've had interpreting the ABC test on your Dynamics. This is a taxi cab driver who uh, had his own vehicle, had his own business, driving his own taxi, uh, advertised, and ran his own routes and accepted or rejected uh, assignments at his, at his leisure. But he did do all of his work for a, another company that had the uh, taxi cab permit in, in the city. It was the biggest company that had the biggest taxi cab permit in, this, in the city. And they argued, the taxi cab company called BTG, they argued that they did not exercise any control over its drivers. Their drivers set their own hours, they set their own rates. This guy used his taxi for his own personal errands. He was not required to sign up for any type of radio dispatch service. He collected his own fares. He could enter into sublease agreements and hold other jobs. He advertised his services in his own name. The court said, nope. With respect to part C, the court emphasized that the worker must be engaged in an independent business. Not that he or she could be engaged in an independent business. And when they looked at the practicalities of this particular, the facts of this particular situation, the court said that the plaintiff was really only driving for this BTG company as a matter of practice. He never really drove for anybody else. Therefore, he does not fit the common conception of an independent contractor because he was not engaging in an independently established business. Um, there was, the court said there was limited evidence that plaintiff was able to provide services to a different taxi cab company because BTG had the most permits. So now, all of these drivers are BTG's employees. You can see this is Uber, Lyft. This is devastating those companies and will in California. The, the, the entire gig economy in California is probably going to go away because everybody who works for you is going to be your employee, uh, not an independent contractor. So the court, you can see how complicated it is, but the court gave us this other great example. Okay, well, when is someone considered to be an actual independent contractor? Well, we don't know. They gave an example. When a clothing manufacturing company hires work-at-home seamstresses to make dresses. Okay, well, that's obvious. They're doing the business of your business, even if they work for other clothing manufacturers. You're a clothing manufacturer. This person is 
sewing clothes, doesn't matter anything else, they're your employee. Or when a bakery hires cake decorators to work on a regular basis on its cakes, the workers are part of the hiring entity's usual business operations. They are not independent contractors. Again, oh, ABC is and, and, and. It's really important. You have to have A and B and C. You have to have free from control and not in the usual course of business and independently established trade or business. Any one of those three things fails, you have an employee, not an independent contractor. Uh, you know, what if a restaurant routinely provides entertainment uh, with band members? The, you know, a lot of restaurants here we have, they have music. Every Friday night, every Saturday night, they have bands come in. Well, is providing music and entertainment now part of that restaurant's usual course of business? If it is, and a court can certainly think it is, those band members are that restauranteer's employees for that matter. Not independent contractors. The W two every all those band members. Okay, so um, it, 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 this is huge. I get questions all the time about independent contractors. Please contact us if you ever have a question, because if you pay someone or you misclassify someone, and it doesn't matter that it's someone or a, an entity, if you misclassify, huge penalties huge potential uh, audits. We have, uh, here's where it comes up a lot. You hire a company or an individual as an independent contractor. Then you terminate the services of that independent contractor. That independent contractor applies for unemployment. The EDD says, oh, but you were being 1099 for all these years. Let's, let's dig into this. We have a case going on right now in our office. The EDD audited this, this uh, company and found that based on this ABC Dynamics test, this worker was actually the employee. They've been misclassified this whole time. This guy's entitled to unemployment. He's entitled to all the wage and hour violations, overtime, meal and rest break violations, and of course, taxes and penalties. So, Please be very, tread very carefully whenever you hire an independent contractor. Literally, unless it's so obvious, like you, you know, you're you're a restaurant and you bring in uh, a, a, an electrician because your lighting system went out. That's obviously that electrician is an independent contractor. <coughs> it's not obvious. You really have to analyze A, B, C. And as you can see, the real estate industry, construction industry, I mean, God, how can a general contractor ever hire independent contractors? Because if you're a general contractor, you can say, well, I'll hire a roofer to, to work on the house. Is roofing part of the general contractor's usual course of business? You can argue that. You know, Uber's arguing, well, driving people around is not our usual course of business. Our usual course of business is creating a platform for drivers and riders to connect to each other on your phone. That's our business, not driving people around. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Franchises, obviously, you know, it's, this is going to be rippling through. We're going to see a lot of cases on this. Uh, I hope none of you are sucked up into it, but. Uh, Stay tuned, stay tuned. You're up. Now what's interesting is that the, the legislature can solve they can have a statute that says this is what an independent contractor is, this is what isn't. So we should probably white show to go to assembly and the state senators, because the courts come up with these things. And the Supreme Court judges, these are people who never had a job. Okay? <laughs> they have never hired anybody. They never had to think about what this person is. That's why they came up with lame examples to find to help us. Um, and they make these rules, thinking of helping the poor uh, laborer who the employer to take advantage of, because you can take advantage of somebody as an independent contractor who is not. But you know what? We're seeing there's a whole bunch of people, especially older people, who want to work, 
They want to be their own independent contractors because the companies aren't going to just hire them, but they might hire on a contract basis. They want to be independent contractors and they can't be because of this law. So the legislature needs to deal with it. And hopefully the legislature will deal with it. And that, that is the issue. Uh, but it is, it is frightening stuff. Okay, so this is um, employer hire. Interesting. Maybe you understand the concept of responding at superior. Employers are liable for the wrongdoings of their employees in the scope of their business. That's the basic law. You have an employee that does something bad to somebody, hurts somebody in the scope of their business, employer is liable. That's why you incorporate it. Um, and an exception to that was the coming and going. Commuting. If somebody got into an accident, an employee commuting to work, the employer wasn't liable. Then there were some cases that said, but if the car being used by the employee benefits the employer, then we deem it to be a company car, and the employer is liable and the commute. Benefits the employer because you require your employee to go drive around and do stuff. Go to the post office, go to court, go pick up stuff, go see customers. Okay, so now this case was an exception to the exception uh, of this. This was a, a case where a public defender, and he would use his car, go to work, and sometimes he'd go to court, go see clients, you know, go to jails and see people, and so on. Um, and that, that would benefit the employer, the company. But he got into a horrible accident on the way to work. But the employer was able to show we weren't going to have him leave the office that day. So that day it wasn't a company car. And the company, and the company wasn't liable. So it's a day by day thing. Um, you want to check with your insurance people. You want to make sure your, your employees have insurance. You want to make sure you have proper insurance. You may have a receptionist on the way home drops off the mailbox. That car is a company car and you're liable for accidents in the community. So just make sure you have a policy on that. And then we do it. Um, okay, so this is, you know, talk about that more. What's this? Right? Okay. Oh, this is. Okay. Uh, the Ninth Circuit, this is interesting. We have the Americans with Disabilities Act, which says you're liable basically for discrimination against somebody who is disabled or regarded as disabled. So if the employer believes that that person is disabled because they are limited in a major life function, that even if the person isn't actually disabled, but regarded as disabled, you have liability as an employer. The, there was a, the Amendment to Disability Act, Amendments Act, um, has now modified that a little bit, and this is the first case that dealt with what does it mean regarded as. This was a guy who had a shoulder pain. Shoulder pain. Generally, you are not guilty of dis disability discrimination if somebody has a minor transient injury. Right? They, they push their ankle running, they, they, they kind of just bump their elbow. That's not really a disability. And, and employees would have to show that you subjectively believe that they were limited in their life. This guy had a shoulder pain. So I'd like to be moved to a different part of the company, that's less friendly. He got fired. Okay, if you brought a suit, the employer brought a summary judgment saying he did not prove that we subjectively believed that he was disabled, that he was limited in any kind of life function. We thought it was minor and transitory. The appellate court said, no, we're going to reverse the summary judgment, you're going to go to trial. If you think it was minor and transitory, that's something you've got to prove in a trial. Just the fact that you terminate this person if by, because of a shoulder injury, that was enough to meet the regarded as disabled test, regardless of what you subjectively thought. So now the employee just has to say, I kind of hurt myself, or I had some kind of injury, or I had a complaint, I told the boss, they fired me, that may be enough. So beat summary judgment. They may lose a trial, but again, you never want to go to trial. So if you lose on summary judgment, you settle. Okay, so it's been very difficult now to get summary judgment from it. So we got it as disabled, and we you know, stuffed it to the and you fired it. You've got to be careful. So come see us about those kind of things that you have. Um, okay. Let's see here. Yeah, this is interesting. This is, um, okay, 
we know that this is the straight okay. We know that you cannot have covenants not to compete. You cannot have covenants, you cannot tell your employees when they leave they can't compete. Okay, well, the, the court now, we really want to see the courts in California, no restrictions on your ability to go make a living and go work. So even though something may not be a complete non-competition, it can be a restraint of a substantial character. This was an emergency room physician who had a falling out, so they settled with the company that, that ran emergency rooms. It's a company that contracted the hospitals to run their emergency rooms. Um, and, and you're allowed to have a no hiring clause. You're not going to hire you back. You agree you're never going to come back work for us. But this agreement said that you're not going to come back work for us. You're not going to work in any hospital that we're managing, their emergency room. And if you are working someplace and we come in and start managing, you'll have to leave. Okay? Well, that's not really non competition because this guy could be an emergency room doctor anywhere. But the court said, it's such a restraint on his, uh, a substantial character of restraint. It's so large. Just a future. I wonder if you end up you know, taking over all the hospitals in the, in the community. I'd have to leave the town. So that was too much. Okay? Too much. So they, they hate these kind of things. The courts are very careful how you draft your, not, you know, your termination, and your non rehire, and things like that. That's very important. So that's a big case. Now, there's another interesting one non solicitation. Oftentimes, as employers, you may have a confidential, confidentiality non-disclosure agreement with your employees. Very often embedded in those kind of agreements uh, is a statement that if you leave for one year, you will not solicit our employees. This was set up and it was approved, basically, for years, because we don't want somebody to raid the company. See, I leave and I take all the employees with me, you're out of business. Okay, so they used to say if it was reasonable in time and scope, they were valid. Well, there was a case that odd facts, specific facts, the case was not valid. The facts were this was a nursing staffing company, a nursing recruiting <coughs> company. Somebody left, and the agreement that they signed said you will not recruit our employees for a year. Well, they're in a recruiting business. So that really was a substantial restraint on what they could do. They can't recruit the people in the industry. And, and that would have been fine if it was limited to this case. But if you read the opinion, it looks like it goes much broader than that. It looks like it can apply to any kind of employee non solicitation matters. So, for now, if that's the case, it's very specific, but the language is such that makes us concerned. So, if you do have that, we should think about it and talk about it non solicitation. They may be able just to leave and call people up. They always can leave and have the employee call them. Or they would ask that employees could answer, but you couldn't call them up and solicit them. Now maybe you can. Now maybe you can. Okay, so this is that. So, <clears throat> just a real quick example on going back to Dynamex because I think it's helpful. This is this is the client I was referring to that is under an EDD audit. The company he owns does custom software for custom software programming for companies. And he has a stable of software programmers all over the place that work out of their homes and do the programming. He treats them all as independent contractors. A client will call in, say we need some custom programming, he'll assign one of his programmers to that client, they'll write the program, done. Well, the EDD has concluded that even though these programmers all work out of their home, they have their own computers, they can do work for other companies, they're not exclusive to him, they can freelance, they found that all of these programmers were his employees because he was in the business of computer programming. So, very, very, very far-reaching decision that I made. Uh, okay, FCRA, if you are doing a background check on an applicant, potential employee, uh, the consumer background check, you've got to use a new form. Make sure you use this new form. It uh, includes a notice about a security freeze feature that employees and prospective employees can activate on their credit to uh, protect their credit from identity theft and so it's very important that you use this new form or you could be in a lot of trouble if you run a background check on an employee. Um, individuals, we've known for a while, now there's a, this case confirms that an individual who owns a business can be liable for unpaid wages. 
You know, this, this, in this case, the attempt at a case, uh, the defendant argued, which, you know, if, if you want to make me personally liable for wage and hour violations, you need to somehow you know, pierce the corporate veil. That's why I have a corporation. You need to show that there was uh, some, some bad conduct that would justify uh, piercing through the corporation. The court disagreed, and they found that uh, because of the way the labor code is written, that even if you are uh, not making the day-to-day -day hiring and firing decisions, just the owner of the corporation, you're personally liable for unpaid wages. And in this, it was a PAGA case, uh, $31,000 in unpaid overtime, and $300,000 in attorney's fees against the individual. Now, unfortunately, you know, you, you, in lawyers we say bad facts make bad law. This is a bad fact. This, the, the company went bankrupt. So I think the court was looking for a way to make the employee whole by tagging the owner. Unfortunately, it's not limited to companies that go bankrupt, the decision. Uh, is your website ADA compliant? Hmm, that's interesting. Well, some big cases have come down. Uh, Domino's, Winn-Dixie, eBay, Netflix have all been sued for having websites that are not uh, accessible to people with visual impairments. <laughs> and the American Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination in any public accommodation. That's the key word, public accommodation. And this, the courts have now found out that certain types of websites, banks, uh, you know, companies where they're providing a service to the public, Netflix, even though there is no, in the Netflix case, there is no physical location, it's just online, 100% online. The court said, no, your website still needs to be ADA compliant. There's guide, there are guidelines, the WCAG has promulgated guidelines for how to make your website ADA compliant. If you think that you may have a public accommodation website, very important that you have your website reviewed and evaluated for compliance with the ADA. Uh, national origin regulations. Uh, we already know you cannot discriminate against or harass or retaliate against anyone for their actual or perceived national origin. So they may, you may, let's say, not hire or terminate an employee it used to be a defense. Well, I thought he was Latino, so I fired him, and it turned out he really wasn't Latino. He was uh, white, but he looked Latino. And you can say, well, see, he wasn't Latino, so no discrimination. Well, now, even if you perceived national or that you that someone had national origin and you terminated them for that, you're liable. National origin means physical, cultural, or linguistic characteristics that may be specific to a national origin group, uh, tribal affiliation, uh, membership in an organization identified with promoting the interests of a national origin group, uh, participation in schools, churches, mosques. The big thing about this law is it essentially eliminates your ability to have any type of language restriction policies. Uh, if your workplace requires, if you have an English only policy, get rid of it or analyze it very, very, very carefully. Uh, it's extremely narrow, high standard of business necessity. If you require your employees to speak English, there has to be a business necessity for that. And that means it has to be necessary for the safe operation of the business not merely promoting the business's convenience or due to customer preference. How many people saw attorney Aaron Schlossberg from New York go on a viral rant uh, telling uh, people in a cafe down in New York to speak English and, and of course went viral and now he's a pariah but he yelled at the workers of this cafe, you know, why do you allow your workers to speak Spanish, this is America, they should be speaking English. Well, that's a customer preference, I guess. And that employer would be, if he was in California, 
and in a lot of trouble if he required his employees to speak English because of that customer preference. It has to be a business necessity. Uh, employment decisions based on an individual's accent are unlawful, even if it may be difficult for your customers to understand. Like, my customers can't understand you. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, the national origin they, it even includes height and weight requirements. May have a disparate impact on the basis of national origin. So really, any type of business uh, employment criteria that's based on any physical characteristic, you really gotta examine that very, very carefully. And these national origin pro, uh, discrimination prohibitions apply to undocumented as well as documented workers equally. Uh, PAGA claim, so we, we've mentioned this PAGA a couple times. It stands for Private Attorney General Act. What well, we've seen in California, because the U.S. Supreme Court has been extremely favorable to employers with arbitration agreements. Arbitration and class action waivers are enforceable. So a lot of employers, especially if there are a lot of employees, they want your, you want your employees to sign an arbitration agreement with a class action waiver so your employees can't bring a big class action against you. The way around it in California is for lawyers to bring something called a private attorney general action, which you cannot waive. And this is a representative action by one employee on behalf of all your employees for a labor code violation. What's crazy about this new law, or if it's actually the case, Huff versus Securitas, is this particular employee was only aggrieved by one labor code violation. But the lawyer who was representing this employee brought a PAGA action citing six violations of the labor code, only one of which actually impacted the particular plaintiff. And so the defendant said, well, wait a minute, this guy who's bringing this action on behalf of the whole company, he's only was affected by one of these violations. And the court said it doesn't matter. Even though he was only alleged to have been affected by one, he was still able, as an employee, to bring this essentially a class action on behalf of the entire company for all six violations, even though he wasn't affected by five of them. Um, so obviously this is going to increase costs to business owners in California. Pago lawsuits are very expensive uh, because 25% you know, of the penalties awarded in a Pago lawsuit go to plaintiff and 75% go to the state. But there are also attorney's fees that you have to pay. So the attorneys are always going to get paid. Don't worry about that. Um, so it's, it's very expensive. Something to be careful of. This boy's up. Okay. Um, <laughs> like being uh, Okay. Here, this is something cage. Meta Well, This was a uh, an employer, Chipotle, fired this lady uh, uh, said that you know we have video surveillance of you stealing six hundred twenty-six dollars. So I'd like to see the video. Oh, it was just stolen. Okay, so she sued, saying they just were trying to defame me because I filed a workers' compensation. The court awarded her eight million dollars. Okay, uh, we don't know whether they had video or not. Maybe they were just bluffing. But uh, video surveillance is useful. Make sure you save it. Make a couple of copies. Make sure it never gets lost or destroyed. But of course, we're going to believe you just did that. Separate person, and you pay eight million dollars. Okay, so that was a, a bad, never will. Uh, now this, this isn't that crazy. This is the de minimis case. California does not have a de minimis rule. Uh, the federal government says, well, if, if a person you know clocks out and has to spend a minute or two doing stuff before they leave, we're not going to make them pay for that. Well, in California, this is Starbucks. But again, Starbucks can't figure out the laws in California. You know? They got all these rules. It's just amazing. Uh, so the, the manager would block out, and then you know you, you go and you bring in the patio furniture, uh, you make sure he's gone, you open the door again, so he come in and play, he left something, and maybe it takes four or five minutes, okay, to do all that. He goes, what? He goes, we're doing stuff, I'm going to get paid. Plucked out, and did these closing things. And over 17 months, it came to $102. <laughs> but he wasn't paid. Okay, so they sued in a federal court, 
and double the, the lower double coils that is the minimus, and it's not going to pay. They appealed to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit said, this is only California law, so we're going to punt it over to the California Supreme Court. What do they say in the California laws? And California Supreme Court said, if it's something, even if it's just a minute, two, three, four, five minutes, but it's on a regular basis, after they clock out, they must be paid for all the time they work. So Starbucks is now changed. The class action that, that was really started this whole thing will continue, but they've changed the procedure. All this sort of bringing the patio furniture and all the stuff that you have to do um, is done. Then it's like that. They just changed it. But then, the, the, well, what does this mean, the minimus? What does this mean? So the Supreme Court justice as well, it not really mean you have to watch fractions of a second. You know, what, how do you cut this off? And I gave some examples of things that maybe we don't have to pay for. Like somebody comes to work and they sit down and they clock in, they, they log in their computer to clock in. There's a computer here, Fletch. It takes two minutes to get it working. You don't have to pay that two minutes. You normally hand out the work schedule at work. Once in a while, you'll send the work schedule at home in an email. Okay, that time looking at it, you don't have to pay for it. Or you're in retail, you're an employee, uh, you clock out and you're waiting for your wife to come. Meanwhile, the customer asks you a question. You don't have to be paid for that. So they give some examples. But if you have a regular routine thing, where somebody's going to work even a minute or two every day, uh, after they clock out, change the policy. So that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, waiting time penalty. <laughs> waiting time penalty. Agents of the law. Okay. As you know, if you don't pay somebody when you owe them their final paycheck, you pay them an average daily wage of pay for 30 days, up to 30 days, until you pay them. That's a waiting time penalty. You pay them. So, and, and it's considered willful. You can just say, oh, I didn't realize. Yeah, still willful, unless you can show that the law is uncertain, or some other government agency said you do not owe me money, or you have an honest dispute as well. Other than that, it's always considered willful. This is a bizarre case. A lady uh, employee resigns on the internet, I mean, over the email. Well, if they, somebody resigns or quits, you have 72 hours to pay them the final paycheck. They mailed the final paycheck, she got it within 72 hours. There was a discrepancy between the words and the numbers. $80 off. So a couple days later she calls and says, oh, there's a discrepancy, I can't cash this. Well, we didn't, you don't have a copy of the check. How do we know you're telling us the truth? We don't know. But if you want, we'll send you $80, or send us the check back, and we'll redo it. Sent the check back, took a couple of more days, and they sent for four months. Well, now it's more than 72 hours. So she brings a claim in the labor, uh, labor commissioner for unpaid wages and for overtime and all this stuff. The labor commissioner said, no, you can't prove that you didn't get your rest break, meal breaks, or overtime, but that was more than 72 hours. So we're going to order $4,500 in waiting for them. Okay, so the employer, well, that's not right. I'm going to appeal. So they appeal in court. And the court said, yeah, you're right. They didn't calculate that right. It's only $25,000 waiting for penalties, plus $86,000 for her attorney's fees. <laughs> because the law is, if they win a penny, you pay all their twenty fees. So if you ever do get a labor code decision that you know, a labor code you're not happy with, but it's two, three, four thousand dollars, you can go fight the labor commission. You lose that appeal is a mistake. <laughs> but make sure they get paid, and if you get paid for later, I calculate the average daily way to pay and add that to the paycheck. Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just actually had that yesterday. An employer client called, we mailed the final paycheck, but forgot to sign the check. The employee said, hey, you never signed the check. This was now five days later. I advised my client, send her a new check, plus five days of pay. That's the only choice you have. So this goes back to the uh, comment that Roy made about the California Supreme Court sort of not uh, not living in reality. Um, because they apparently didn't think that calculating overtime was complicated enough. <laughs> so they wanted to make it a little more complicated. We know that when you calculate it, it, overtime for an employee, you have to do it based on the employee's regular rate of pay. That's not just their hourly rate wage. It's their hourly wage plus any bonuses, uh, incentive bonuses, other types of compensation. And in this case, a employer paid a $15 attendance bonus if employees agreed to work on a Saturday. 
So they got their hourly wage for the Saturday, plus they got a $15 bonus for working on a Saturday. The court said, here's how you figure out what to pay the overtime rate. Anytime you give employees a flat sum bonus, and it could be at any time during the year, that bonus gets computed into the wages for that pay period if they work over, if the employee works overtime. And in this case, and, they, and the reason the court said that is because the flat sum bonus isn't tied to the number of hours of work. It was the flat amount, $15. Whether you worked four hours on the Saturday or eight hours on the Saturday, you got $15. So what they want you to do is to, to take the, divide the amount of the bonus by the total number of non-overtime hours. So let's say it's a 40 hour week, you take the $15, you divide it by 40 hours. And then you multiply it by 1.5, not 0.5, 1.5, which comes to 56 cents. So if your employee is making $15 an hour, you're going to add an extra 56 cents to their overtime rate to, to take into consideration the $15 flat sum bonus. Make sense? Everyone got that? <laughs> um, now, you know, what's, what's really frustrating is this particular employer was trying to do it right. They were trying to incorporate the bonus by using the federal guideline and they multiplied it by 0.5 instead of 1.5. And they, that was even what was in the DLSE, the California DLSE, Department of Labor Standards Enforcement. Their guidelines, the state of California's guidelines said to do it this way, and that's how the employer did it. And the court said, we don't care what the DLSE says. That's not law. We're the law. You did it wrong. Pay it. Um, okay, this is an interesting case. Company has an employee, employee has an ex-girlfriend. The ex-girlfriend doesn't work for the company, has nothing to do with the company. Ex-girlfriend had a, it was a domestic dispute between the employee and the ex-girlfriend. The, the employee was arrested, and, but never convicted. Comes back to work, the uh, employer was, says, you know, there was no violation of company policy, nothing happened at work, this employee's a good employee, we like it. All right, well, a month later, the ex-girlfriend decided to get some revenge because the domestic violence charges were dropped and the guy was never convicted. So the ex-girlfriend sent an email to the employer of her ex-boyfriend saying, you know, when he was arrested, it was because he threatened me. He threatened me physically while we were at home. And the company, looked into it and they said, oh, interesting. Well, we actually have a policy, very strict policy, no, no threats. It's in a workplace violence, we take it very seriously. Even if the threats occur outside of work, again, this is all off duty, this all happened at this guy's house, not during working time. Even if those threats occurred off duty, it's very serious and it's a terminable offense. So they fired this guy. And he said, whoa, that's not fair. Um, and the courts agreed with him, or the jury did, because they said that, look, the law, as we talked about a little while ago, you, employers are not allowed to take action against an employee for arrests that did not result in conviction. And that's what he's claiming you did. You, were, you took my ex-girlfriend's email, that I was arrested, and that I threatened her, was never convicted of it, and he believed her and he fired me over that. And the jury awarded him $18 million because they found that the arrest was a substantial motivating factor in this guy's termination. So, very, very scary case for employers uh, to be aware of. But make sure, if you're ready to fire someone, do not do it for any legal reason even if it's one of the many reasons. Um, so maybe four years ago, we used to talk about the NLRB was cracking down on employers' ability to uh, 
limit employee conduct at work in terms of, you know, you have to be polite, you have to be respectful, you can't yell at people. And we said, no, the NLRB says you can't do that, the National Labor Relations Board. Well, now we have a new president, we have a new National Labor Relations Board. And the National Labor Relations Board has now said that it is lawful to maintain facially neutral policies that require civil conduct in the workplace, prohibit rude or disparaging communications, uh, prohibit disruptive or disorderly conduct. So you can now put in your handbooks that disruptive, disorderly conduct is prohibited. The issue before was by saying that disruptive or disorderly conduct was you, uh, prohibited, was it was squelching the employee's ability to complain about their working environment. <laughs> and that they would feel in, that they couldn't freely express how upset they were of, about their wages and their working conditions. And the National Labor Relations Board wants to make sure that employees can get together and pitch all they want. So <laughs> now you can have a policy that says, no, at work, you need to be respectful and uh, not rude. All right, so let's look at some uh, cases Roy's going to talk about now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Arbitration. That's a big one. The, the, the circuits in the state have been split on, on, on the NLRB whether you can require employees to waive their wife and their wife. Obviously, the NLRB said no, they can join together to consider the activity, to improve their wages and hours, and you can't stop them from class. The U.S. Supreme Court in the Epic case said, Arbitration agreements, because of the Federal Arbitration Act, which covers everybody basically, but people in transportation business, interestingly they're not, but everybody else, that law supersedes any state law, and it says you must, it must arbitrate. If arbitration is bad, would you agree? So you can't have an agreement with your employees as a condition of hiring them, or continue even employment, if there's some consideration, um, but they agree to arbitrate individually, not join a class. So you can be quiet for that, uh, which is interesting. Um, whether you want to do that or not, then you've got to be very careful. You've got to also watch your, you know, conscionability, procedure, and uh, substance. You can't have the employee come in with a stack of papers and say, "Okay, sign all these first day papers. In Ten minutes, come see me." No. You want to make sure that arbitration agreement is first of all easy to read English. If you put arbitration rules, you give it to them, and they have time to review it. If they're going to sign it electronically, make sure you comply with the Federal E-Sign Act and California Uniform Transac Electronic Transactions Act. We recommend the <coughs> paper, have them sign it, have them have time to read it and review it. You can do that, arbitration. Um, but you have to consider whether you want that. Okay, arbitration has some pros. It might be a little cheaper sometimes to arbitrate. Uh, it's no one way jury. Uh, it's private. On the con side is there's no appeal. You can't do dispositive motions. There's no summary judgments very difficult in, in arbitration. But what's happening is in Chipotle, again, you can just tag a bunch of this. Uh, instead of a class action, plaintiff's lawyers are saying, well, we're going to take all you know, 300 employees and we're going to file 300 individual arbitration actions. In California, <laughs> the employer must pay the cost of the arbitration. It's five to ten thousand dollars just the arbitrator's fees. So let's take out 300 of these. That's off the bat, look what you're paying. So you have to you know, weigh whether it's worth doing or not. Some employers are saying, we're just gonna maybe do wage an hour, has to be by arbitration. Other stuff doesn't. So it's something to think about, whether you wanna have uh, this arbitration, mandatory arbitration, class action waivers, and, and it's a lot to think about. Okay, for employers, so we have to talk about that. That's big. Also, what's interesting is you have an arbitration agreement, any kind of arbitration agreement, and, and somebody says, I want to bring arbitration, and then you would say, no, we're going to go to court because this problem we have is covered by the arbitration agreement. The arbitration doesn't cover this. Well, if you put in an arbitration agreement, the decision whether or not the issue is subject to arbitration will be decided by the arbitrator, then it must be decided by the arbitrator. Even if it's holy ground, there's actually nothing to do with arbitration. If you said, you should make anything related to this area, the arbitrator decides whether this is something that is public. And, and this was Justice Kavanaugh's first written decision. Uh, so if you want to decide whether you want that, you want the arbitrator to always be the one to decide whether this is even subject to arbitration. That's interesting. Landing. We've always talked about landing. Um, 
I'll kid around a little bit, you know, a few minutes away. And the, and the Supreme Court, and other courts, said uh, very clear that you can have rounding. In this case, it was 10 minutes. But as long as over the long term, it averages. Sometimes low overpayment, sometimes low overpayment. It's fine. Even in a case like this, where the person's lunch, you're supposed to get a half hour uninterrupted lunch period. But because of rounding, you only got 20 minutes. It rounded up to 30 minutes. Because it doesn't matter. Rounding is fine, even though they only got 20 minutes. But what's interesting in this case is the employee wanted to argue, but I really took my lunch break. It was all phony. I, I, they didn't keep all my time records right. Yeah, I didn't get my rest breaks. And the court denied that testimony. Wouldn't even let this employee put that testimony on because at the bottom of her electronic timesheets, it said I certify that I've taken all my rest periods. Rest periods and meal breaks, and I have an opportunity to do so. You can't go back and counteract your certification. But put those kind of things on all your time records. You don't need to get language we can help you do that. That's a big one. We talked about this restriction on salary. This is fascinating. As Pitt mentioned in California statute, somebody can volunteer their salary. Now you have it in your brain and maybe consider it. This is a Ninth Circuit case covered California, which will govern our rule. They said you may not consider prior salary under any circumstance whatsoever, no matter how you own it, why you own it, you can't even can be in your brain. So you must look at your policies and make sure that you have clear criteria how you pay people, and you pay them according to that clear criteria, and, and prior history is totally not been on your list. Okay, that was, that was a big uh, case. Okay, oh, okay. that was a big one. Uh, bad case, never considered. And we got a little bit of time, we're going to talk about some pending cases for the California Supreme Court that are fascinating in life. This is a case that's been going on for a while, we've talked about it in the past. That Apple has a policy that if when you go leave work, you have to have your badge checked. Because you can be stealing iPhones, you know, and sell them on the corner. So we're going to check them. So somebody said, well, I'm spending 5 to 15 minutes a day in line. I'll get paid for that. And they brought a suit in federal court. And the federal court said, no, you're not going to pay for that because it's voluntary. You can leave your bags in your car. You don't have to bring your bags into work. Your backpacks and your purses are in the car. Uh, it's voluntary. Therefore, you're not going to get paid. And it went up to the um, Ninth Circuit again. Ninth Circuit said, no, we, we can't figure out California law either. We're like Starbucks. We can't figure it out. So we're going to punt this over to the California Supreme Court, and they tell us whether or not standing in line for 5 to 15 minutes to check out is paid. It's compensatory. California says employers have to pay as long as somebody is under the control of the employer or the employer is putting that person's work. Well, the question here, it says you have to stand in line here until you get your turn to check your backs. Are you under the control of the employer? My guess is the California Supreme Court would never again have a job in their lives. It's going to say, oh, of course they should be paid. You know, so we'll see what happens. But that's how it's in the California Supreme Court. And our next seminar, you'll find out how they decide. <laughs> <laughs> Ted will wrap us up. All right. Home stretch. Uh, another interesting pending case. Just like the uh, gig economy is probably out in California, payroll provide payroll service companies are probably going to go out of business in California, depending on how this case comes out. The boom, large boom. Um, this is an employee sued her employer for um, wage and hour violations. This was a rest break, meal and rest break case. She also sued ADP, who was the company's payroll provider. And this court is going to decide whether a, an employee who was not given her meal and rest breaks can sue ADP. And if they find that she can, there will be no more ADP in California, or paychecks, or any of those guys. So this is a really important case. Uh, again, another one of these hours worked type of cases. This is actually going to be a decision whether, how we define hours worked, just like in the Apple case. When you're waiting in line to check your bag, is that hours worked? This is a, a, a employee at a correctional facility, similar type of situation, where there's processes that have to take place after the shift ends at the correctional facility. Are those hours worked, compensable time, that you need to pay the employee during those uh, post-clock-out 
Period. Now this one is really interesting. This might just put an end to California all together. So, uh, out of state airline, right? This is an airline that does not have uh, an office or a, a physical uh, headquarters in California, but sure, they have planes that come and stop in California. It's just like every airline, it drops people off at LAX, the flight attendants get off, they might uh, go into the airport terminal and get something to eat or drink. So we have some flight attendants who do not live in California, they do not work in California, they are literally transitory employees who come into California for a few hours at a time on layovers. While those employees are in California, are, does the employer have to abide by California employment law? for the few hours that the employees are in California. We're gonna find out. And that, that's gonna have a very significant effect on out-of-state employers operating any type of business in California. You know, you send an employee to California for a meeting, you might, maybe you're in Texas, you send an employee to California for a business meeting, you now have to comply with all of the California law while that employee is at that business meeting. I mean, it's just crazy. So. Well, another interesting case that we'll find out next year uh, at, at our update, what happened. Uh, so we have about five minutes left. Oh, we do have a drawing. We have a drawing. Um, Put the business card in with that. Let's see. While we're waiting for the drawing to come up, does anyone have any quick questions? Yes, sir. Can you generate some work and share some of the building stuff every single day? Can we put in your name? So again, English proficiency, that's called English proficiency. It would be based on business necessity. So is it necessary for the safe operation of your business that the employee is proficient in English? Now keep in mind, for most required disclosures, if you have five, some is five, some is 10%, depending on the specific disclosure, of your workforce that is not proficient in English, you have to provide the notice in the language that the employee is proficient in. So if you have, let's say, 10% uh, of your workforce that is only proficient in Spanish, you have to provide your employee handbook in Spanish, you have to provide your, note, your legally required notices in Spanish. And for those types of things that you're talking about, again, it's, it's an analysis of whether your business necessity requires that they be proficient in English, or is it just convenient because you don't want to have to pay to have it translated? On the basis of the card. All right. So now we're going to do a drawing for uh, a very exciting prize. All right. Okay. Okay. We have the great prize. Um, finish line pages. Back there. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. We can, uh, yeah. All right, we'll be here for a few minutes if anyone wants to come ask us questions. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.